shining a light on autism and life as an autistic person. Welcome to My Friend Autism, a podcast breaking down barriers, stigma and misconceptions around autism while increasing understanding and acceptance of the autistic community. And now, here's your neurodivergent host, Orion Kelly. Thank you so much for listening to my friend Autism. I'm Orion Kelly. I'm autistic. And my purpose is to inspire you with knowledge, education, and growth opportunities through these open, honest, and engaging conversations on autism. We are here, my friends, to increase the level of understanding and acceptance of autistic people. Trust me. Trust me. The findings of this particular report are not only astounding and alarming, They are heartbreaking. The findings on the quality of life of autistic Australians. There's nothing about the findings in this report that are anything aside from utterly unacceptable, completely and absolutely unacceptable. Okay, so this is what happened. In 2019, the the Senate of Australia. So I'm not going to get into the whole Westminster political system, but basically, you know, we have the two houses, federal parliament, that is the two houses. You got the House of Reps and you got the Senate. Okay. So the Senate, they put together a thing called the Select Committee on Autism. Okay. So the Australian Senate did a Select Committee on Autism. Services, support and life outcomes for autistic Australians. In March 2022, the final, I guess, report and recommendations were released. What I want to do on this podcast is basically share with you the executive summary findings. And then we can, we can dig a little bit deeper and then talk about how this makes you feel as an autistic person. Keep in mind, these are findings from Australia, a relatively successful developed country, right? We're not talking about a developing third world country, right? I'm going to read to you verbatim. Okay, I'm just going to read the report. And of course, I'll chime in from time to time. Okay, executive summary. The evidence provided over the course of this inquiry provides a compelling case for change. Autistic Australians and their families are often discriminated against and have difficulty accessing the services and supports that they need. Maintaining the status quo is simply not an option. Now, this is reported in a Senate report, okay? This is in writing from elected representatives. At the centre of the committee's proposed reform pathway, now this is basically the big ticket item, they propose a national autism strategy. This strategy would coordinate efforts to improve life outcomes for autistic people and have clear and measurable goals by which progress can be tracked. So here's the part that broke my heart. Here's the part you don't want to hear. If you're an autistic person or you have an autistic person in your life, this is the part you you do not want to hear. You want to hear it, but you don't want to hear it. Okay, so as part of the executive summary, in big bold writing, life outcomes for autistic Australians are unacceptably poor. This comes at an enormous personal, social, and economic cost. Hi, I'm Orion, I'm autistic. I've been saying that in my videos and my podcasts for quite a while now. Elected representatives have put in writing, they are actually admitting autistic Australians have unacceptably poor life outcomes. We'll get back to you. (laughs) I mean, it's a report and they've done the work great. Where's the action? Not the action about, oh, we've got three different people presenting the report, three different politicians. I don't give a crap about these silly photo ops. Fix it. You found the truth. You fix it. Okay. Back to the executive summary. This is the part, me talking again, this is the part that you want to hear. Okay, check this out. These are actual facts. Autistic people in Australia. Between 2019 and 2022, when the the research, when the, the study, the whatever you want to call it was done, okay? Autistic people have a life expectancy more than 20 years shorter than the general population with more than twice the mortality rate. This isn't a study done across the world by the UN. This is actually a governmentally run, 
consultation, investigation, report thing, select committee, whatever you want to call it, done in Australia from 2019 to 2022. Modern day Australia. I'm autistic. I'm Australian. I have a life expectancy more than 20 years shorter than the general population of Australia, including my wife. I'm not making this stuff up. You can search it yourself. Find it online yourself. The Senate Select Committee, right? It's, it's right there on autism. Australian government, it's free. You can download the PDF right now on the website. Read it along with me. This is legit. I'll continue on. Autistic people experience high rates of co-occurring mental health conditions and are more likely to attempt or commit suicide than other groups. Now, before we move on, I just want to quickly say, if you or someone you know seems like or believes they need help or needs to talk to someone, please reach out to organisations within your region. In Australia, things like Kids Helpline, Lifeline, Beyond Blue, or whoever it is in your region. If you or someone you know needs help, please reach out to these people. They are there to help you and you deserve help. Here I am, an autistic guy, an autistic dad, an autistic husband. I sit down to read a Senate report findings on autism. The first three lines of the executive summary. I've got a life expectancy 20 years less, more than twice the mortality rate, co-occurring mental health conditions, and I'm more likely to attempt or commit suicide than any other group, than any other group. We're talking about autistic people in modern day Australia. This is astounding. When you're an autistic person, you don't have to read these facts to know that life is just a bit overwhelming. And it's just, what's the point? What am I offering? What am I providing? I don't see any worth. The government don't see any worth. They've done a report for three years. They've put it out. Okay, what are you doing? And I mean, what are you doing yesterday? What are you doing yesterday? Not in, not in two years. Not until after the election. All right, let's move on to the next part of the findings. 75%, 75% percent, seven, five, of autistic people do not complete more than a year 12 education in Australia, while the unemployment rate for autistic people is almost eight times that of people without disability. The unemployment rate for autistic people in Australia is almost eight times that of people without disability. Autistic people appear to be overrepresented in the justice system and at a higher risk of homelessness than the general population. We are talking about autistic Australians, people that have a medically diagnosed neurodevelopmental disability. Every time I think about this, it makes me feel really upset. I've got to keep going. <sighs> More of the report. Inclusion of autistic people in the community is also poor. Oh, really? Oh, really? With many autistic Australians experiencing loneliness, isolation, exclusion, and discrimination. For an autistic Australian, your vibe, the vibe from the community, is get stuffed. Like, you're weird, you're wrong, go away. Loneliness, isolation, exclusion, discrimination. Do you think that might have something to do with the life expectancy, the mortality rate, the depression? Like, do you think that's got so Yeah, obviously. More of the report. Significant numbers of autistic people report having no friends other than family or paid staff. Okay, so let's do this from a, a kid's point of view, right? Okay, so my, my son, he's got his mum, his dad, his little brother, and paid staff for us would be, I guess, support workers, right? You love support workers. They do stuff you want to do. <laughs> they take you places. They look after you. They're paid to be a friend kind of thing. Adults, I could say the only friends you could have are your family and your workmates. But are they really, like, they are your friends because you see them and you work with them and you think they are your friends, but in many respects, they're just being friendly because they're your workmates, right? Okay, so more of the stats. Likewise, many families say they feel unwelcome at community events or unable to leave the house due to negative public reactions to their, now this sentence, I'm going to read it verbatim, to their child's autism. It should read, in my opinion, due to negative public reactions to their autistic child. The report, in effect, surmises what's just been talked about, saying behind each set of numbers are thousands of autistic children and adults, autistic with a lowercase a, I think it should be a capital A anyway, who have been denied the opportunity to fulfil their potential and live healthy, safe and productive lives as well as scores of family 
who have been pushed to breaking point. I'm a husband, I'm a father, right? Me and my wife have an autistic child and we know the challenges of raising autistic kids or the challenges, I'm assuming, of raising any child who may have, you know, special needs, which I, I find un, un, that uncomfortable to say that. They have different needs. Anyway, I, I get it's hard. I get it's hard. This is about autistic people. This is about autistic people. If we can help autistic people, guess what? The families won't be at breaking point so often. I'm not trying to offend autistic parents. I am autistic. And I am a dad of an autistic son with a neurotypical wife. I live this life. I understand this life. I don't, I'm not trying to get into an argument with you. There is no argument. I'm an autistic person. I'm having my opinion. But what it smacks of to me is the consultation period they consult a lot of organisations which are run by, in, from my experience in Australia at least, mothers and fathers of autistic kids. Now, these mothers and fathers aren't autistic, they aren't diagnosed autistic, or they haven't disclosed they're autistic. So you have to take it as they're neurotypical. So that smacks of, you know, appeasing the big organisations run by non-autistic mums and dads. Uh, frankly, I'm a little bit well, I'm conflicted. I'm not too sure about this anymore. In 2022, with these statistics, there, I don't think there should be any more organisations in Australia for the autism community that are run solely, solely at the top by neurotypical people. It doesn't make any sense. You can put it into any other scenario and you explain how it makes sense. So you've got a neurotypical person at the head of an autistic organisation for autistic people. Should a white person be at the absolute head of an organisation whose sole goal is to service the needs of people of colour. Most people would say, well, no, that doesn't make a lot of sense. In an ideal world, you'd want to have someone who actually has an idea of what they're, <laughs> what they're trying to achieve and the people they're trying to serve. How is it different? Okay, so this report is pretty groundbreaking in that it's basically showing the world, you know, even in 2022, in a country like Australia, autistic people are stuffed. We are stuffed. <laughs> We're dying between 20 and 30 years before neurotypical peers. It's outrageous. We struggle in the modern school system because the modern school system, by the way, isn't modern. It's like 200 years old. You come to work in the morning, you get certain breaks, you must work in between those breaks, then you can go home. And this way we'll teach them how to work for us and not ask questions for the next 30 years. Okay, so it doesn't work. The report states meaningful systemic changes would have an enormous impact with instances of good practice demonstrating how this can be achieved. No duh. During the course of the inquiry, the committee heard first-hand accounts of the devastating impact that inadequate or inappropriate support has on the lives of autistic people, and here we go again, and their families. The drivers, let's continue, the drivers of poor outcomes for autistic people are complex and interrelated. That's interesting. I just read the report before and it looked like it was pretty basic to break down the main issues you need to address here, my friends. Education, mental health, health support, inclusion. It is clear to the committee there is no single cause of the poor outcomes experienced by autistic Australians. Among other factors, the committee heard that key drivers of poor outcomes for autistic Australians include a poor understanding of autism within the community and among service providers. This is where I'm going to break stuff down. Okay, so let's talk about this. I don't know everything about every disability. So it's okay to not know stuff about disabilities. It's okay not to know stuff about autism. That's cool. That's why I, instead of just whinge and whine, I make videos and podcasts just like this to try and help people who want to learn more about autism. That is a work in progress. And my, my one point I'd say about that is, this is where we need to be lifting up actually autistic people who advocate. Okay, so people who are autistic, we are creating content or advocating for autistic people. Lift these, you know, I'm, okay, so I'm one of those people. There's many out there. Lift them up. Stop lifting up professors and doctors and non-autistic people who think they can speak on behalf of us. And the second part of that is they're saying there's a poor understanding among service providers. So for starters, you know, in Australia, in the type of Medicare system that we provide and a lot of you know, government-funded services and supports, the, the NDIS, National Disability Insurance Scheme, this is a lot of a lot of stuff is managed by government. So they're saying that service providers, and sure, there's a lot of private, but they're, they're saying they've got a poor understanding. Okay, well then you failed. You failed. Why don't your service providers have a better understanding of autism? That's your fault. That stops with you. Okay, the next driver: workforce capacity 
constraints. These are some of the key drivers of poor outcome for autistic Australians. Delays in diagnosis and early intervention. Okay, so this is there's two parts here. Number one, delay in diagnosis is 100%. There's a lot of adults being diagnosed across the planet. Some women may have been diagnosed with OCD, ADHD, eating disorders when they were girls or you know, teenagers or young women. And in the end, that really wasn't the diagnosis. It could have been a co-occurring, it could have been a misdiagnosis. They've been, I guess they've fallen through the cracks. There's a lost generation. I'm part of that lost generation, an adult diagnosis. Okay, yes, you're right. Delays in diagnosis are bad, especially for adults. When you get to 30, 20, 30, 40, you look back and go, where's my life gone? I've lost my life. I'm grieving the life I could have had that I didn't have. It starts now, but what about all that? And then they talk about early intervention. Okay, just when I say intervention, do you think of like someone who has a drug or alcohol problem? We're intervening. We must intervene upon the lives of autistic children as quick as possible. Intervene to intervene on them as autistic people. To what? To what? If you're an alcoholic, we want to intervene so you are not an alcoholic. So if you're autistic, we want to ensure early intervention to ensure what? You're not autistic? Okay, the next part, the next driver. A complex and poorly integrated service environment. I'm moving on from that, <laughs> like seriously. And the final one is, and services that are not designed to meet the needs of autistic people. This is a big one, probably right across the planet. In Australia, if you're a part of the NDIS, so let's say the government provides you with funds for services and things to, to assist you, they don't meet the needs of autistic people. One of the more stunning things in the report is about poor understanding of autism within the community and among service providers. Now, this is, this is astounding. This is actually in the report. Despite its prevalence and the fact that autistic people make up the largest single Disability group within the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia. Autism appears to be poorly understood in Australia. So when you say, sorry, Senate, when you say appears, what do you mean appear? Why do you have to keep everyone happy? Don't say it appears to be poorly understood. It bloody is. You, what half the drivers in the preceding paragraph said it was. You can't say it was and then say, oh, it appears to be. No, it doesn't appear to be. The committee heard. The ignorance of autism within the community, as well as stereotypical views of autistic people, present significant barriers to the social and economic inclusion of autistic people. The lack of understanding also extends to providers who deliver services to support autistic people. Seriously, this, this, it's 2022. The report goes on to say that generic disability strategies have proven ineffective at improving life outcomes for autistic people. Really? Did that take three years, I would never have thought that generic strategies would be ineffective. That makes no sense. Hang on. Are you saying generic strategies for people with a disability would be ineffective in improving all people with all disabilities? But they're generic. Generic works every time. <laughs> so at the core of the report, is the key takeaway a national autism strategy should form the centrepiece of efforts to improve outcomes for autistic Australians. The next point they make is the national autism strategy should be co-designed by the autism community. A couple of issues there. First thing is, why do you need to put that in a report? Okay, so we've got to come up with a better way of helping autistic people. You know, do you think we should talk to autistic people? Oh, really? What? <laughs> I guess... All right, put it in the report, maybe someone else. I mean, seriously, the bottom line is, of course, autistic people, the autistic community, autistic people, should be included in this. How many podcasts and YouTube videos do people like me have to do before anyone even remotely picks up the phone and, and has a, a quick chat, a conversation? For goodness sakes. So the report states the key priorities for the National Autism Strategy should be guided by the recommendations of this inquiry. Okay, it's not an exhaustive list. But these are some of the key priorities identified by the committee. These are basically what they're saying is these are the big ticket stuff we've got to do. Building understanding of autism within key professions and across the wider community. Okay, firstly, yes, obviously. But if we're going to do that, let's start with the autistic community. We're always going back to the well of neurotypical run organisations for autistic people. And if that hasn't, that clearly hasn't worked, the report says that. So let's stop going back to the well. All right, next priority, improving access to early diagnosis and intervention. Okay, well, you know, you know my thoughts on that. Okay, I agree, agree. But there are a few word changes there. We need, definitely need to get 
better access to early diagnosis, not only from a time point of view, but a financial point of view. It's extremely expensive for some families, extremely expensive, long waiting lists. So it's not just about, oh, we'll get you through quicker. No, no, Hank, you're going to pay for it too. And we're talking about support services, services that can enable an autistic person to live their best life. That's what they should be getting access to. Not classes in assimilation and acting neurotypical. Another priority. Improving service integration and coordination. Yep, that makes sense. I mean, clearly it states that this government and, every, and the preceding governments have all failed in that, given they've said some astounding things have been found and they're saying that the service integration and coordination must improve. Okay, you can, you, and you can say, oh, no, but we're, we're just putting our hand up and acknowledging it, saying we'll fix it. Now, well, that's great, but until you've fixed it, you are actually just, you know, waving around. Fix it then. You made a mistake, you stuffed up, you didn't do good enough. Do better, do it now. The next priority. Improving education, employment and health services for autistic people. This is massive. This is massive. Education. Like we said, the report found barely get to year 12. Now, you've seen my videos and podcasts. I got to uni, studied law, but I didn't graduate. I quit with barely a semester left because I, I'd reached the point. I couldn't navigate that neurotypical system anymore. And the types of inclusions they gave me, they just weren't relevant. They weren't helpful. You can't give someone more time to write an essay or do an exam if they never got the content in the first place. Giving me an extra week to write an essay doesn't help if I still haven't got what they're trying to teach me. Does that make sense? It's broken. It's broken. Employment's the same. The HR policies, right? You have to be neurotypical. And the fake made-up term being professional. There's kind and compassionate and considerate and respectful. They're real things. But professional, that's basically saying that's a, that's, that's a word for HR to use to make you behave a certain way. But if you have a different brain, you can't just do that. Supporting parents and carers is another key priority. Okay. And the final one is establishing a national autism research agenda. This is a little bit more tricky for me. What we require is autistic-led research. There are plenty of amazing autistic researchers, PhD candidates, professors, whatever, right, out there. They have to take the lead. The research has to be relevant and appropriate to improve the lives of autistic people, not some rubbish crap like in the UK where they were trying to get parents to hand over their autistic kids' DNA swab saliva sample. It's got to be specifically focused to autistic people led by autistic people. There's just a couple of things I want to talk about that the committee found on education because there's a lot of parents and carers out there. Okay, so... The committee heard that autistic students and their families contend with gatekeeping practices, inadequate consultation, a lack of appropriate adjustments, and high rates of bullying. If you're a parent or carer of an autistic child, who can't relate to that? Oh, that's every day for my kid. That's every day for my autistic son. The report also said that the use of restrictive practices in place of proper behavioural support strategies was also ongoing. Heartbreaking for autistic kids. The report also said that the committee believes that all mainstream schools should work towards becoming inclusive schools modelled on universal design principles. However, they realise it's going to come at an additional financial cost that many mainstream schools simply aren't resourced to meet. In addition, most teachers and school leaders are already time poor and overburdened. So what they're saying is the lives of autistic people are really bloody crap and one thing for autistic kids is school. It's bloody horrible. There aren't a lot of specialist schools out there. Mainstream school is often the only real option. It isn't good enough. It needs to get better. Not getting better is, in my opinion, a legal breach. There are actual equal opportunity rights, disability discrimination rights. So the report says they've got to get better and they've got to do it. But then, you know what? It's going to cost a lot of money and the teachers don't have much time. So... What really resonated with me was about uni, college, higher education. In relation to the higher education part, the committee heard that significant numbers of students did not disclose their diagnosis for fear of discrimination. It also found that, well, obviously in not disclosing this means that students are left without support and are exhausted from trying to mask being autistic. The report wrote, mask their autism. In turn, this can result in students withdrawing from their studies. Hello, this is what I just told you my story about law. I did. That's exactly what I did. I would love to have finished, but I just wasn't able to be provided with what I needed as an autistic person. And yeah, you're right. I was exhausted. I was gone. I was shot. I couldn't do it. These are some astounding findings. In 
modern day Australia 2022. These are the facts. You can check out the entire, I don't know, 439 pages <laughs> if you'd like. You can find it, my friends, the Australian government website. It's free. It's available to anyone. The Senate Select Committee on Autism. I hope this has provided some sort of insight into the genuine life of an autistic person in the modern world, not 20 years ago. In the last couple of years, isn't it heartbreaking and astounding? It's so stark. It's so sad. Hey, thank you so much for watching the video podcast or listening to the podcast, My Friend Autism. I really do appreciate it. Now, if this episode has resonated with you, I mean, hello, seriously, <laughs> I, I'd love it if you'd share it with people because people need to hear this information. Share it with your family and friends. We want to reach more people. You can continue the conversation. Say hey to me by liking the Orion Kelly page on Facebook. Go to the website, orionkelly.com.au and send me a message. We are here, my friends, to raise that level of understanding, acceptance and appreciation of the autistic community. All I'm asking is for you to open up your hearts and minds to people a little bit different to you and embrace the benefits of neurodiversity. Until next time, thank you for opening up your hearts and minds and embracing differences. 